Hello, Amy. Hi, Rod. How are you? Uh, waiting for winter to come. It's down here in Dallas. It's short sleeves. Weather out there today. And uh, it, it can't be Christmas. My kids are wondering, when are you going to put the Christmas decorations up? And I say, when it gets cold. <laughs> it might be Does Christmas Does it ever Eve. get cold in Dallas? You know, it does, surprisingly. Whenever you hear the words wintry mix on the weather, you know people are ready to freak out. And me, coming from South Louisiana, whenever I hear a wintry mix, first thing I want to do is get out the gumbo pot and start cooking. <laughs> so um, we, need, we need some gumbo around our house. Well, we've got some snow up here that we can ship down to you if you'd like. Send it away. It might melt on the way. Well, we, we just cleared uh, Mitt Romney out of our Texas airspace this week. He was down in... Um, down in College Station giving the big speech. What do you think of the speech? Um, well, I have lots of things to say about the speech. Uh, we need to not be remiss again <laughs> in introducing ourselves, though. Uh, so I will do the quick, I am Amy Sullivan, nation editor of Time Magazine, and here, I suppose, representing the progressive view. Yeah, and I'm sorry about that. I, I keep forgetting the housekeeping. I'm Rod right. Dreer. I'm a columnist at the Dallas Morning News, member of the editorial board, and a blogger for BeliefNet.com, and I give the conservative view. And uh, Mitt Romney's speech is really the topic of the day, and I was surprised. I, I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit more about it, uh, because I was really underwhelmed by the speech after first just thinking that he shouldn't give it at all. Um, I just thought it was kind of a lose-lose proposition, because those folks who weren't going to vote for him because he's Mormon, I don't think were ever going to be swayed by whatever he said, uh, but certainly I don't think we're put at ease uh, by the speech. And the people who didn't really worry about it, I think now have had it elevated in their minds as something that they now associate with Mitt Romney, uh, which could be a problem for him just considering how many voters still don't know who he is or know much about him, which we found out in a time poll this week. Hmm. Well, let, let's, let's unpack some of that. I... I am not a Mitt Romney fan, um, but I do think he's been getting a raw deal on the Mormon question from evangelicals here in Dallas, a lot of evangelicals, and uh, I've been really surprised by the number of evangelicals I talk to who will not vote for him simply because he is a Mormon. End of story. Full stop. And I, you know, they and they say that the, the line typically is, well, he'll believe all that. What won't he believe? And I said, well, you know. It, if you're, in, if you're trying to appeal to an atheist as a Christian candidate, you know you have to you have to realize the hurdle you have to jump there is convincing the atheist that the fact that we as Christians believe that a man rose from the dead uh, that's a pretty big hurdle. It seems weird to them, but nevertheless, I, I think you're right that I, I, there's no way that he's going to be able to to win those hardcore folks over. But I think he had to give the speech because it was just hanging out there. And I think he did the best he possibly could have done under these circumstances. He gave a speech that was very much within the tradition of American civic religion. And I thought from a political point of view, it was very canny the way he tied in religious tolerance to what it means to be an American. And he put his critics on the defensive. He basically said, listen, you know, if, you, if you're going to reject me because of this, even though I agree with you on the broad issues, then you are less of an American. You are less of a patriot. And he put it that baldly, but I think that's what he was saying. I also thought it was pretty canny, and uh, from again, from purely political perspective, that after after saying that he stands with, the, in the broad tradition of uh, American uh, civic religion, he brought up um, the, he criticized secularists and the Islamofascists, not, not a word he used, but right. Muslim militants, as if to signal to, to the primary voters, hey, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, I really am one of you. Let's stand together against these enemies of faith. So, uh, I mean, it's a shame that he had to even make this speech, to be honest. I, I think it's, it's absurd that he had to, but he did have to, and I think he did the best he could with it. Yeah, you know, I do think it's a shame. I don't think anybody's religion should be a disqualifying factor, um, nor do I think any candidate should be giving kind of a seminar on Mormonism 101 or Judaism 101. Uh, at the same time, uh, that's another lose-lose part of this proposition, is he gave a uh, what was probably for him, as you say, politically canny primary speech. But the comparisons with Kennedy's uh, address in 1960 here are instructive in that he was giving a general election speech, and it was pitched very much towards loading Catholics within the broader American electorate and within society. 
and he took care to include those who have no belief or mm-hmm. who don't go to church, in addition to those of many different beliefs. And Romney really threw the glove down to say, I'm going to associate myself with religious conservatives and put the question to you, who are you more afraid of? Are you more afraid of Mormons or of secularists? Because I'm one of you against those guys. And he drew this line of us versus them um, that I find personally a bit disturbing and that I also think, should he become the general election nominee, uh, might make him far less palatable to independent voters and to some Democrats who might have previously crossed over to this fairly liberal Massachusetts governor uh, than they will now. I think that's a good point, and I, I was really startled when doing some research on on Romney and Mormonism in American politics last week to have run across a poll, I believe it might have been a Pew poll, but I'm not exactly sure, showing that Democrats are actually more uh, likely to avoid voting for a Mormon because he's a Mormon than are Republicans, and that, that really did surprise me. I, I didn't think that, Dem- I would have thought Democrats would have been more tolerant than that, but uh, it does show that, that Romney has, is going to have some serious problems, even if with his Mormonism, even if he should become the nominee. Mm-hmm. And he didn't well, help himself in that regard with his speech the other day for the reasons you you brought up. I, I, I wish we could put the whole, Roman, the whole Mormonism thing behind us, but clearly it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, and the one last thing I'll say on that is, um, you know, I, I think I was struck, as most people were, by the fact that he said the word Mormon only once. Yeah. Uh, and it was in a very forceful, and I thought quite good, defense of his faith and refusing to back down, saying, if this disqualifies me, then so be it. But I'm not separating myself from my faith, nor am I pretending that it doesn't mean as much to me as it does. However, as careful as he was to talk just in vague terms about my faith and my church, if you were watching on CNN, as I was, there were these graphics up on the full screen to the left of him throughout the first half of his speech with these, what I guess the producers thought were going to be handy tidbits about Mormonism, that were things like Joseph Smith claimed that God told him to have more than one wife. The Mormon church (laughs) didn't allow blacks into the priesthood until the 1970s. This sparked protests and riots. I mean, there were six or seven of these things that I have to think the Romney campaign is not happy about, and that did exactly what he was trying to avoid. He was trying to get past getting into these specifics, uh, but journalists, as you know, are, we are fascinated by something that is new, and Mormonism is really new to our political discussion. And so I, I think these will continue to be raised, whether or not he thinks he can say, look, asked and answered, I addressed it in the speech, that's it. Well, I think you're right about that. And I, I also noticed on the CNN crawl, they had news about Warren Jeffs, the convicted fundamentalist Mormon leader, and yeah. I thought, oh, <laughs> this is Might really well unfortunate for Mitt Romney. Big love up there at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, but you know, I, I'm reminded in this whole discussion about Romney and Mormonism uh, of Tom Wolfe's line. He said uh, that a uh, cult is a religion without political power. And that's the thing you always hear, at least I hear here in, in Texas, about Mormonism. Well, it's a cult. It's a cult. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, from a purely sociological point of view, I, I think that the Romney candidacy is uh, is right there on that on that edge there he represents this minority religion moving to take political power and uh, I, I think that he may go down he may not succeed and I, I don't think he would succeed I wouldn't bet on him today but I think that uh, we're going to be hearing more and more from Mormons uh, in the coming political cycles and um, they're going to have to come up with some way to present their faith to the American people to make it seem less scary and and strange. And uh, it's quite a challenge. Well, and I have to say, before we move on, um, the church in Salt Lake has done a really remarkable job in being proactive. Um, They have done a couple of rounds of journalists, both in D.C. and in New York, just kind of sitting down and saying, you need to know that despite these questions that he felt he needed to address yesterday about whether the leaders in Salt Lake could tell him what to do, they have uh, always had a policy of not uh, telling Mormon office holders that they need to take a particular policy position or not, or rebuking people who uh, hold uh, a position that perhaps the majority of church members do not. Um, so that's something that is uh, an interesting kind of public relations step that the church has taken, but you're right, there's so many misconceptions that whether that has an impact uh, is hard to say. 
but since you uh, since you put out there that you don't think that Romney is actually going to end up winning the nomination, I think I'd like us to move to discussing who might, uh, particularly since um, Mike Huckabee is the other religion name in the, uh, the GOP field these days. And he's really uh, the one who I think, for me, stopped Romney's speech from being as effective as it could have been. Because by drawing these lines of, you need a social conservative and I'm one of you, so you should back me, um, that would work if Romney's only other uh, opponents were people like John McCain and Rudy Giuliani and Fred Thompson, who now says he doesn't really go to church. Uh, <laughs> but Mike Huckabee kind of screws that up for him. You know, I, I, one of the most surprising things I read about Huckabee this week, aside from his massive flip-flop on immigration, which we right. can get to in a second if you want, was uh, something that uh, uh, was in the Washington Post uh, that a Democratic political consultant or a pollster in Alabama said that Huckabee is the candidate that scares Democrats the most because he connects with ordinary people. Ordinary people can see some of themselves in Huckabee. And I think that's really true. I mean, here at the Dallas Morning News editorial board, Huckabee came by earlier this year in March when nobody knew who he was and nobody would have predicted that come December he would have been leading in Iowa. I wasn't able to be at that meeting, but most of my colleagues were. And we are a socially liberal editorial board. And my colleagues went in there prepared not to like him. He completely won them over. They really liked him. Even though they didn't agree with him on gay marriage and abortion, they said, this is a man who's fair-minded, he's funny, he's human, he's thoughtful. A lot of the same things people say about Barack Obama and how he's a different politician, my colleagues were saying about Mike Huckabee, and I think that accounts for Huckabee's rise. He's just so good at making that gut values connection with people. Well, and he's really challenging what has been kind of the conventional wisdom, I think, on the right for the last few decades, which is abortion was the litmus test. If you were pro-life, you were conservative. And if you weren't pro-life, you could not claim the label conservative for yourself. Now all of Huckabee's opponents are trying to say, well, he's really a liberal. Uh, you know, his previous, as you point out, immigration stand, uh, they said, was too liberal. Uh, his economic policies are too liberal. His uh, questioning of whether torture is a good idea is too liberal. Um, and yet, under the previous definition of what it means to be a conservative, you would think he's the one guy who really fits it. You know, I probably remember the, the Pew survey in 2005, I think it was, about just where the American people, that's sort of a portrait of Americans' political values, and it picked up a, an important shift that I think could have predicted the rise of Huckabee on the right. It showed that, uh, that a lot of people who vote Republican were economically progressive, moderate to progressive, but socially conservative. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I said, wow, that's really, really interesting. And that's exactly where Huckabee is. That's why he, where he's positioning himself. He's got that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. The opinion makers on the right freaked out by it because he, he doesn't quite fit the, fit the mold. And I, I think that the, the anti-Huckabee reaction from the Republican Party and so many opinion makers on the right really does show to what extent the money men, the, econ the free market economic folks, really do drive this party and it's in front from the very top which, in a way, goes against the, uh, a lot of liberal stereotypes about the evangelicals are in the driver's seat. Right, although I think that part of this is also coming from his opponents, who feel like they were working from the right script, they thought, but it was the script of the 80s and the 90s, and to some extent the early part of this decade, uh, where if you check the boxes on gay marriage, if you check the box on abortion, then you're all right. Then you can get a pass and you can go do whatever you need to. Um, and here they see this guy who, as you say, probably reflects more, at least where a lot of evangelicals are, um, mm -hmm. if not the Republican base as a whole. Because um, just as a side note here, I actually took those Pew numbers during my very short stint as a uh, social scientist um, in grad school. And I ran them to break them down, uh, not by just party and by... Uh, political leaning in terms of liberal, moderate, and conservative, uh, but also by religious uh, affiliation. And what I found is that Republican evangelicals were far more likely to be on the left or to the center on economic issues, whether it was expanding welfare programs, uh, universal health care, a number of these different points, uh, than their non-evangelical Republican counterparts. 
Um, and so, you know, in other words, being evangelical actually moved you to the left on economic issues in a way uh, that non-evangelical Republicans were not. Yeah, I, I wonder how Pat Robertson feels having endorsed Giuliani, seeing how Huckabee has keeps rising, rising, rising. I mean, it's it really does. This is such a watershed election in so many ways, and I. I really think that this is going to be the, the last who robbed the old religious right. I mean, that's almost a truism now that it is, but you really, you, you can see it. This Huckabee guy, Christians I talk to here in Dallas, and it's, it's just anecdotal, but he's got their imagination. He really does. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I hate to say it as well, just because news magazines are uh, rightly ridiculed, I think, for every five years proclaiming either the birth or the uh, death of the religious right. Um, but this really is that changing point. Um, as you say, you've got different leaders endorsing all different uh, candidates. It's not that everybody's decided to get behind one guy. Um, and that's really uh, diluting the influence, I think. But it also means that the people in the polls almost have more power. They can decide for themselves instead of following kind of the establishment candidate everybody got behind. I think it's healthy. I really do. I mean, I've you and I have talked about this many times offline about how frustrating American politics are. Certainly for me, as a religious conservative, I'm so fed up with my own party here, and I'm ready to see some change. And you know, I was talking with a colleague this week. We're, we're going through a, uh, something here at the newspaper. We're trying to decide which candidates we're going to endorse in the primaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to make our endorsement at the Dallas Morning News before, long before the Texas primary, in fact, before Iowa, because we think it's important. Mm-hmm. And I was talking yesterday with a colleague about Obama and Huckabee. How they, both of them strike me as the real change candidates in this race. Um, if you, you know, whatever their, their positions are, their, 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 their politics, their personality really is so different. And I think that if we saw an Obama-Huckabee race, I could get really excited about that because we would, I mean, I'm sure it would get ugly. I don't want to be naive about this. Politics are always going to be politics, but... Both of them do seem to speak to the, the, the better angels of our nature. That's not too modeling to put it that way. I just enjoyed listening to both of them. They seem so much more human and less programmed than, than Hillary or McCain or any of the other ones. Is that well, fair? I think there's something to it. Uh, that's certainly that the Obama campaign would say that's the case they're making, is that he's a different kind of politician. Um, and I don't know if you heard his speech uh, to the Jefferson Jackson dinner in Iowa uh, about a month ago, but that's the case he's making to explain why he's running now, why he didn't just wait four years or eight years. Um, and, you know, if, if you're sympathetic to it, it's, I think, a fairly compelling case uh, because what he's saying is we sometimes elect people for the moment not just because you look at your resume and you decide that they're the most qualified person that time around. Um, you elect them because they there's something about them um, that can either heal the country or that is perfectly suited to the specific policy cha- challenges that we're facing. And one of the things he points to is the uh, image and influence of the U.S. around the world. And he makes a case that just the simple election of him to the White House would change overnight uh, the way that the U.S. was perceived. And then he tries to expand that, I think, to uh, how domestic politics would be different, which I think is a harder case to make just because people are so kind of uh, solidified in, in the partisanship um, that has really emerged over the last 10, 15 years. Um, but, you know, you've mentioned, and I'd like to hear more about this, uh, about his possible appeal across party lines. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I'm a Republican who is really excited by Obama. I almost certainly couldn't bring myself to vote for Obama because we differ so much on issues. But uh, you know, I secretly hope, if we're going to have a Democratic president, I hope it's Barack Obama because I, I, I remember watching the Democratic, watching the, the Democratic convention at home in 2004, and you know, and Obama gave that speech, that famous speech of his, and I, I told my wife, I said. That's something different. That's great. Listen to that guy. And then, of course, Al Sharpton gave his speech, and it was, you know, more of the same. You know, it's forever Selma with Sharpton, and because because his whole appeal depends on the fact on, on, on making the the argument that nothing ever gets better for Black Americans. Obama seemed to get beyond that, and I I think that if he should win, 
one of the great gifts that an Obama presidency would give to America is to advance the conversation on race beyond the 60s paradigm. And I think more broadly, uh, he would get us past this whole boomer fixation, uh, this whole boomer, I don't say political moment, but it's more than a moment. You know, I, I, it'll just seem to move us forward. And even though Mike Huckabee is a boomer, um, I, they just speak in different ways uh, about politics. And I, I find that tremendously encouraging. And I, I find talking to Republican friends once we've gotten over complaining about whatever Obama's uh, positions are, people really like the guy. And one last thing, I'm kind of reminded of back when I was in college, and uh, actually I was in high school in 1984. I was, believe it or not, Amy, the head of Louisiana School Students for Mondale. <laughs> and, yes, and um, I remember getting so angry at my father. You know, I said, you know, you're, you're a working class guy. You know, why are you so strong for Reagan? And I remember looking at the poll numbers, and uh, so many of the people would agree with Mondale on the issues, but they were all for Reagan. And uh, I didn't understand it at the time because I thought, well, you should just be logical about this and just go with the person who, who, who stands for the policies you believe in. Well, I was stupid. People vote for, vote on, on personality, and it's not necessarily a bad thing because they, they vote on conviction, on, a, on whether or not they could trust the candidate. I think Obama is going to have tremendous appeal on that level. Do you think he's got the uh, momentum to be able to win in the primaries? Obama? Mm-hmm. Oh, I think so. I mean, I think this whole thing this week, and I'd love to know what you thought about this, but Hillary's campaign criticized him for what he said in kindergarten. I mean, it was a, it was a petty remark, and it was, kind of, it was just a small little blip. But I think it's so telling about her candidacy. Her candidacy is so controlled and so intense, and I, I, I think that it was a very symbolic moment. Or am I reading too much into it? No, I agree that it's symbolic. I would disagree that uh, that's a result of her controlled campaign. I think she has had, up to this point, extremely disciplined for very professional uh, operation. Uh, and this, to me, was a rare example of them slipping up, and perhaps even of her personally slipping up, uh, because that's not the type of kind of desperate move uh, that she has been making. Um, nor that I think you want to be making at this point in the campaign. People in Iowa pay attention to stuff like that. Uh, and there was a, a report just out yesterday about one of her uh, former co-chairs in Iowa who's now switched over to the Obama campaign, in large part, he says, because he doesn't like the negative attacks. And I, I think there's a moment here, and I guess I'd expand uh, the, the discussion just a bit, um, to ask uh, whether it's possible to really distinguish between what people have just taken for granted, assumed, well, negative campaigning, it works, people respond to it, it's always going to be part of politics, you can't do anything about it, or to try to get to this point a few candidates have where you say, no, there are distinctions you can make, and those are legitimate, and it's not fair for the Clinton campaign to say every time Barack Obama raises a a, a point of argument against Hillary Clinton that he's breaking his promise to uh, follow a new kind of politics. Uh, but that there are distinctions about how you run campaigns. Uh, there's this group uh, in Ohio that uh, formed during the last election called We Believe Ohio, and I'm forgetting the exact name of their campaign, but they've just started a, a I think, sleaze-free uh, campaign for uh, uh, Ohio politics that so they're asking politicians to sign on to. Uh, and the obvious question here is, does that just doom you to uh, lose your next campaign if you sign on to one of these pledges. But I think it's a legitimate question of, should we just all throw in the towel and assume that negative campaigning is just the way of the game? Or is there a possibility of changing things? Well, you've asked a big question. (laughs) I I think the reason this particular uh, faux pas hurt Hillary was because it reinforced the, the impression a lot of people have that she's ruthless. She'll stop at nothing to get power, even going through Barack Obama's kindergarten records, you know? And uh, so I think maybe the kind of negative campaign you do matters a lot. You know, if she had just left it at criticizing Obama, he says that he's, he hasn't been planning a run for president, that's not really true. It's the fact that they went back to the, to the degree of going to third grade and, and kindergarten that, that really struck people as being indicative of a certain mindset in her campaign. It's a so, bit petty. Yeah, yeah, I mean, do you agree that was really petty? 
yeah, interviewing somebody who was his uh, kindergarten classmate. Yes, seems to be a bit petty. <laughs> well, uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is that negative campaign does campaigning does work, and I think it's always going to be with us because it, when it gets right down to it, people are going to be ruthless. But I think you have to be careful about the kind of negative campaign you do because this particular gap uh, played off of a stereotype inadvertently that a lot of people have about Hillary Clinton and reinforced their fears of Hillary Clinton. Don't you think? Yeah, I I have learned not to predict how uh, things are going to be perceived uh, by voters and how they'll react to them because I am... Uh, just as often wrong as I am right. Uh, but my instinct would be that you're right, that uh, this is going a step too far, that there's a difference between um, really hammering on uh, things like someone's experience and their candor um, and, and seeming to manufacture issues, which uh, is what this feels like. Um, and I can't imagine but that uh, it would help um, and could, in fact, hurt her campaign. Well, and Obama and, and Huckabee, for that matter, they both seem to be naturally optimistic guys. They're not, they're, they're loose-limbed. They just, they just seem very personable. And it, it feels very trite to sit here and praise that aspect of them as potential presidents. But, you know, that's what politics is about. It's, I remember uh, Matt Dowd and Doug Sosnick wrote that book, Applebee's America, uh, last year, either last year or two years ago in which they talked about the most important factor in American politics is making what they call the gut values connection. And to that degree, to the degree that that's true, the personality of the campaigner is very important. And um, they just both seem like the kind of people you, you could stand to listen to for four years. It's Hillary Clinton? A, no. Well, it is important. And uh, I'll just say I was out in Iowa a couple weeks ago, um, and I was struck by a couple of things following around Obama. One is that, uh, you know, like everyone, he's fallible. And uh, I had heard him, I was in Boston for the convention in 2004, and of course had heard that speech like everyone else. Um, and uh, he doesn't always come out with that every time. And it could be interesting to watch, particularly when he has a pretty flat audience, and Iowa audiences can be hard because they just sit there with their arms crossed waiting for you to impress them. And they don't give you a lot of energy to feed off of. Um, so, you know, in some some cases he fell flat, and in others he was the candidate you expect him to be. Um, but he does kind of refuse to be a, a traditional politician. And the, the one thing that he does in every speech is he ends with this long story that sometimes gets very long, depending on how worked up he is about it, uh, that ends with uh, the chant, uh, fired up, ready to go, which you may have heard, which he used uh, in the Jefferson Jackson speech. Um, and after leading the audience through a couple of rounds of fired up, ready to go, he ends it with just this very casual, come on everybody, let's change the world. And he walks off the stage. Um, and it's just this both tossed off, but very uh, kind of embracing line uh, that the audiences really seem to react to because he's, he's asking them to be part of something that is bigger than just him. Um, and I don't know whether people will really respond to that when it comes time to choose uh, a, a candidate, whether in fact they'll decide they want somebody who they think could really manage uh, Washington. Um, but it's something I haven't seen in a very long time. I think, frankly, I'm excited by that. We're running out of time here. I wanted to ask you, though, before we go, if um, what do you think that the media will start looking at regarding Huckabee and his religious beliefs? Because he's kind of gone under radar till now, but now that he's the front runner in Iowa, uh, people in our business are going to start taking a long, hard look at him. I think the whole question of evolution that keeps coming up is an indicator of, uh, of some of the scrutiny he's going to face. I have to think that's a bogus issue, not only because, you know, Huckabee, Huckabee's right. He says, look, I'm, we don't set education policy in Washington, but also because, and I say this as someone who believes in evolution, uh, the great majority of the American people don't believe in evolution. This is, strikes me as something that is uh, a concern of, of elites and the liberal media elites more than anybody else, the kind of people who aren't likely to vote for Huckabee anyway. Right. Am I wrong about that? Well, it, it worries me slightly. Um, from both sides. Uh, the first is that this is the question I hear all the time. 
when I go talk to liberal audiences, when I talk to uh, members of Congress even, uh, folks will uh, raise what they think is the conversation ender of, well, these people don't even believe in evolution, so how are we supposed to work with them anyway? Uh, and it just strikes me as incredibly elitist, and every time I have to walk through the fact that a lot of polls ask people to choose. They say, do you believe in evolution, or do you believe that God created the Earth? And faced with that choice, I think most people are going to go with their faith over science, even though I would venture that most Christians, and it may not be the vast majority, but most Christians believe both. They believe in evolution, and they also believe in the creation story. And so it's kind of a false choice to, to force them. Now, Huckabee has made it clear that he is not one of those people. He does believe uh, that God created the earth literally as it is in the Bible, and that he does not think that evolution is right. And so there my concern is that I think it is legitimate to ask him if, and if so, how, that would impact his views on science policy and on public health, even. Uh, because there have been a lot of changes under the Bush administration uh, that have not, in my view at least, been good in terms of where we've gone with science and where we've allowed uh, particularly medical research to go um, and where we've allowed it to not go, uh, perhaps more importantly. Uh, and I think it's extremely legitimate to make sure that somebody who's running for the White House explains how their personal views would impact those sorts of policy decisions. I can agree with you on that. I, I, I don't think it's illegitimate to pursue that line of questioning with him. It's just that it seems the way the evolution thing has been brought up till now has been more of a cultural marker. Mm -hmm. In the same way that, you know, I hear some evangelical uh, Republican voters saying they're not going to vote for Romney because if you believe that crazy Mormonism stuff, what won't he believe? Right. It's the same. That this is the liberal it's secular the version of that. Again. You know, and if, it's, if we can ex use, use that as a jumping off point to explore his view of the proper role of government and science, mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. But if it, if it just is one of these gotcha moments, uh, right. if that's the way the press plays it, it's not going to do the damage they think it's going to do to him. And it, in fact, it, it may, may in fact help him. I think you're exactly right on that. Um, and that's the danger whenever uh, we take a very shallow look at these questions and try to use them just for kind of uh, gotcha moments or talking points. Exactly right. Well, anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? Uh, well, we do have Christmas coming up. Uh, and uh, I think, I hope that we post alongside this dialogue, uh, I forget what the diva log uh, <laughs> word is for it, uh, the column that you recently wrote about uh, consumerism and Christmas. I think it's quite good, and I think it may even fit in with uh, the other issue that's been in the news lately, which is the question of uh, tainted toys and how worried people should be, particularly parents who are out shopping for their children, and perhaps one of your solutions would be, well, just don't buy toys for Christmas <laughs> this year. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I wrote a, this column um, about the religious right. You know, here we are in December, and it's the, the you know, war against Christmas, all the, the usual thing we get every year this time of the year. It, it occurred to me after a visit over the Thanksgiving holiday, my wife and I were out buying uh, winter coats for the boys at a shopping mall in Louisiana, and uh, you couldn't get away from the Christmas carols. And the woman at the at one of the outlet stores said, oh, they've been playing this for us since October. And he even went into the bathroom to use the bathroom. And there's the speaker above the toilet, you know, blaring out, oh, come all ye faithful. And I thought, this is really blasphemous. I mean, I'm, I'm a serious Christian, and I, I just resent the way that uh, in our commercial culture, more and more and more, it seems, every year, almost measurably, uh, Christmas is just an excuse to sell, and you can't get away from the commercialization of Christmas. Even though everybody always complains about it, nobody ever does anything. And one thing that bothers me a lot about my side of things, and we're so busy, we conservative Christians are so busy, you know, riding, riding a, a vigilance against the ACLU for, for trying to shut down the crash and that sort of thing, we completely ignore the way our commercial culture that take, really does take the meaning out of Christmas. And I think that it it is just time to take a stand and say no. And, and you can't stop the culture, but you can right. stop it yourself and do things different in your own family. And I hope people will do that. Well, and that may be, in fact, the real issue here is uh, perhaps the target shouldn't be whether you know, greeters at Walmart are saying happy holidays or merry Christmas or none of the above. 
uh, because if you're at Walmart uh, focusing on your consumption for the holidays, then you're probably missing the point anyway. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, this is a real point of, of, of commonality that I found in my book, Crunchy Cons, uh, writing about the the, uh, the way consumerism and our consumer culture does tend to erode families and, and communal values. And I found a lot of liberals uh, responding to that, and, you know, and I like that. And I think that, you know, the more the more we can get past uh, the sort of the the, the trenches that, that have been dug out for by both the Democrats and the Republicans over the last thirty years, the culture war trenches, and come across there. Well, it'd be like that movie. You remember the movie um, about Christmas where the the, the the Germans and the French uh, during World War One they came right. out of their trenches yeah. and they said <laughs> they said Silent Night. Well, we need to have one of those. Again. I think, uh, 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 war, the war against Christmas is waged mainly by the consumer culture, if you ask me. Well, uh, once when we agree, uh, which I think makes us a total bust in terms of blogging heads, <laughs> because we're not exactly uh, the debating, uh, sparring duo. But uh, be that as it may, it's always fun having a conversation with you, Rod. Yeah, well, I'll see you in, uh, in no man's land. You bring the champagne. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, take care. Right. Take Bye. care. Bye.